we started out with we started out with like 30 or 40 members and now we're up to 450 so it's it's a testament to the current board and the past boards for all the really wonderful work that has been done to help grow, um, grow the chapter um, if you have any questions um, regarding the chapter or being part of the chapter contact anybody on the board uh, and we'll be happy to have a conversation um, i'd like to really thank ProSearch. they're our platinum sponsor they um, really have been a partner with PMI Maine for 20 plus years and consistently have supported the chapter and can't say enough about um, ProSearch. We're looking for um, other sponsors. You just back up once, if you don't mind. Sorry, Joe. Yep. Um, yep. We're in conversations with other um, organizations. Um, so you might see the gold and silver sponsor. Um, updated it in the, in, the, in the next in the next event I just want to throw that out Megan awesome thanks Joe You're welcome. Um, for the volunteer spotlight in June member event um, I'd like to introduce Megan Adams our treasurer uh, she'll be walking us through um, our May volunteer spotlight and our upcoming events thank you Danielle our May 2023 Volunteer Spotlight, we have Kristen Sensabaugh. She is heading up the PMI Maine Volunteer and Book Club. Um, to, she, she's coordinating that effort, excuse me. And that book club event will take place on June 22nd. So be sure to not only check out our new website, but also take a look at our uh, calendar events listings and sign up for that book club. PDUs will be awarded for those who are reading the book and participating in the book club. Uh, we do have our PMI main board of directors roundtable also in June and that will take place June 20th. So be sure to visit that event and bring your questions or uh, anecdotes for us. A little bit of repartee there. If you're mm -hmm. interested in becoming a PMI main volunteer, reach out to Danielle or any of us. Wonderful. Thank you. And yes, thank, big thank you to Kristen for um, your efforts in helping us get the book club coordinated. Um, amazing job with that. Good, great question, Chandra. Thank you for that. The June, the June book is a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There uh, by Marshall Goldsmith. And it's actually a book that, that Global PMI used as part of their um, What's, what's called a power skill back in 2019. A, gr a great book to push your career forward and, and develop upward momentum as a project manager. Thank you. Awesome. So yep, check out our website for the more details around that. Um, and I think some of those additional details are also forthcoming. All right, so, um, you know, wanted to also welcome and congratulate some of our recent PMP certifications. Um, as Joe mentioned, we have uh, upwards of 450 um, current members um, with four new members uh, between April and May who have recently joined us. Uh, Warren Graver, Michael Harms, Rachel Hooper, and Colin Lemont. So welcome um, to the PMI main chapter. Um, and we have two um, members who have recently received their PMP certification. So Neil Rita and Danette uh, Terrell. So congratulations um, to, to those, those two folks. Uh, it's not um, an, an easy test to pass, but you did it. So congratulations. All right, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our um, PMI main May member event speaker. So this evening we have Craig, Craig Piper from SMRT. Um, Craig joined SMRT in 1998 and has managed some of the firm's most complex projects. In particular, he is most proud of his contributions for Maine General's Medical Center, um, Alfond Center for Health. Um, 
Also, Craig serves on the chair for SMRT's board of directors. He helped, gu he helped guides the firm, co firm's collective vision for the future, and he also served on a variety of local um, nonprofit boards and lives in South Portland, um, where he is an active member of the South Portland Comprehensive Planning Committee and enjoys running um, on city trails. Craig truly fosters personal connections with his clients, um, inspiring their loyalty and sharing their enthusiasm for success. Um, Craig has a Master's of Architect from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a Bachelor's Degree in Landscape Architect from Syracuse University, um, Sunny College of Environmental Science and Forestry. So Craig, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to kick us off with tonight's event, Architecture and Engineering Project Management Practice, practice uh, Global Perspectives and Local Impact. Well, thank you. Um, I guess one thing, uh, the, the title, I'm not sure where the title Global Impacts came from, but that um, uh, always good to start the presentation by making a correction. Um, but <laughs> So the, the goal of, of, of today, and, and thank you from Benga from our office who, who um, uh, provided the opportunity for me to present to your team today. I think the, the idea that of, of architecture and engineering firms have um, similar sort of background of project management that all of you deal with every day. It's just, I guess there's a twist in the way we have been educated in project management as well. So it's a it's a, 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 a unique topic and hopefully you'll find interesting. I'm gonna do a little bit of, of sort of behind the scenes as well of what we what we do and how we do it. Um, so as an architect or an engineer in front of a lot of uh, movers and shakers in the state, we always have to tell a little bit about who SMRT is. So there'll be a little bit of marketing here. Um, and then a little bit of how we work and understand all the uniquenesses of our projects. And then ult ultimately we'll share some projects and, and why they're unique and every project is unique. And I think all project managers would agree um, there isn't one project that is the same every time. Uh, I guess I should have confirmed, does everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Sounds good. All right, so SMRT, um, for those who don't know, we're, um, we've been in Portland Peninsula since 1884, for, formed by John Calvin Stevens, who is a, a local architect here. He's known for some beautiful homes in the, on the peninsula in Portland and along the coast, specifically Cape Elizabeth. And um, we are architects and engineers um, and do really focus on complex work. So all architecture, all engineering, site civil, interiors, as well as energy. And we have four offices, as you can see on the map across uh, New England and New York. The areas that we focus on are these six major sectors, um, education and athletics. And our, our one project is the USM project currently under construction in the Portland campus. And I'll share a little bit on that. Um, we work a lot in the government sector, and one of the projects right now, we're, we've done a master plan for um, uh, the state of Maine on the sustainability of all their facilities. So that was a real exciting project to sort of um, transition the future of the state of Maine office buildings. Um, justice is a big part, health and wellness, science and technology, and workplace are our major focus areas. Um, our core values, um, we uh, like to live and breathe these um, as a firm of 140 people and always reinventing ourselves with these core values really takes us to the next level. And, I, you know, obviously I won't read these, but one of the things that um, that we're really excited about is, is, is sort of our success. Um, all these elements of our core values of succeeding together and thriving really culminated this past week when we were awarded four AIA awards um, for the state of Maine on our projects. And we were thrilled and honored to be recognized for all the hard work. And our team is, is, is 
beyond belief. As architects, it's nice to, to have awards. So project management. Um, so one part of project management for us is, and I, I assume for many of you um, as an architect, we learned our discipline, learned how to be an architect. We didn't look, go to school to learn how the business works. We didn't learn how to project management. And so these are how we focused and focused our energies on getting work, doing the work, getting paid for the work, and then getting the next project. So those are, in some ways, our core values these days as a project manager in our SMRT um, firm. So the A&E industry, um, just to give you a little background, so overall life of a project, say it's a, you assume a 50-year life cycle building, um, the, the design and construction portion is just a sliver of the cost of the building throughout that duration. And so understanding how we shape in those first um, design moves that you make in the construction really leads to the, the overall life cycle of a project. So our goal is to figure out how we can keep the, the, the pie small for design and construction, but in some ways really reduce the operation cost over time. And that's one of our goals as, as a firm. Uh, many people have seen this sort of slide of decisions. Um, in our world, we are designers. We put things on, on digital format that then get built by a contractor later on. And our, our instruments of service or what we do is drawings for someone else to build. And our drawings, um, there's a process that we go through, and I'll share some of those. But this, this sort of diagram of the further we finish our work and right before construction changes is the biggest component of, of, of the cost of a project. And so as the project gets further along, any changes cost more. The sooner we can make and get to the goals of the project earlier, pushing decisions early is really a goal of our industry. And and as project managers, our goal is to structure our processes to make decisions for the owner that that are are clear and concise and and allow for the owner to make the right decision at the right time. So um, Benga shared sort of the PMI or a PMI standard industry of what a project manager does. And a lot of things are very similar of, you know, the different types of elements, the teams, when, the how you finish a job, how you start a job, what is the plan, the communication plan. We really focus, excuse me, on, and I'll just highlight sort of ideas and, and ways that we, we reinforce the role of project manager in SMRT is, it's really primarily the client contact and the maintenance of the client. You're also outward facing with the client, you're inward facing with your own team, but primarily the, the role is client management and maintenance, understanding the project's history, understanding decisions. The project manager is the one who owns the project schedule and understanding we sometimes have to create new work out of nothing. And that's that's a really interesting piece of a problem. We have a client who has a problem that needs to be solved. We have nothing to rely on other than our process of how to get there. Um, we always embrace the, the project manager has to embrace new technologies to improve our processes and not not always go back to the what we did 10 years ago. We always have to be looking to the next piece. Um, as I said, sort of getting the work, doing the work, getting paid for the work, all comes down to what is the scope of the project, what is the schedule of the project, and what is our fee. We are people, and we, we do not make widgets. We make um, uh, elements that are, are for the contractor to build. And so we have people and we have hours. So understanding how we manage those hours is really the goal of our project manager. So, <coughs> excuse me, how do we start a project? Um, 
we have, there's many different ways, but it ultimately comes down to there's a proposal, you understand the terms of the contract, you assemble the team, you clarify who the decision makers are, and then ultimately in our firm, the biggest, biggest line is getting all that information in one place so that the team and the project manager and the firm has that metrics. What are the goals? What are the deadlines? What is the hours? What is the budget? And then our frequent managing of those costs is um, the only way that we can manage projects. So the other, as I said, the idea that the project manager is ultimately the client relation. The other portion of our firm is that they have to lead the team. So willing to improve processes and address quick issues quickly. I talked about that change diagram, you know, making decisions early. The other component is we are not perfect. Our drawings don't include all, everything that a project needs. Um, there's times where things are miscoordinated very rarely, but there are times when things are missed and, and not coordinated. And the project manager has to accept that this is part of our industry. Nothing is perfect. And the contractor may make mistakes and interpret our drawings incorrectly. We need to work with them. So understanding that they, and understand how to course correct. The other really important piece is the team leader, the project manager has to be brief, concise, and accurate. Nothing long-winded um, presentations like I'm doing right now are not necessarily the best way to get decisions made. Excuse me. We the project manager works really hard in making the internal team look good. Tell <coughs> apologize. We talked about the um, landscaping, but I guess we have uh, allergy season out right now. <laughs> yeah, Craig, feel free to take your you know yeah. take time if you need to. <laughs> we I. No I'm okay. That were coughing okay. earlier as well. <laughs> right. Um, you know, again, telling our stories and <clears throat> leading our lessons learned is really a key key component. <clears throat> How do we manage the client? <clears throat> Excuse me. We have to be responsive. We need to work hard to make the client look good. <clears throat> we have to be curious about the client's business. That is um, so important to that client management. If they if if the client understands that we know their systems and their problems and really being an integral part of their team, that is a huge set success to making the project successful. And the other component is making the connections on, <clears throat> on behalf of the client is really important. You know, we work with a lot of different clients and sometimes we can marry industries or partners together to move things forward. So the, our project managers need to know about their project, but other <clears throat> projects in the firm, and then also understanding um, the client's business. It's super important. So the other component is, is sort of understanding that projects have a start date, they have an end date. And our end dates are typically when a client is moving into a project. <laughs> So we don't like to trip before the finish line. As we know, project managers, you work really hard and then one mistake can rattle the whole, the whole house, of, house of cards. So don't trip before the finish line, stay connected. And then understand on the process is understanding where you are in a project. Sometimes when we establish our proposal and our project early on and our fees, the project sometimes takes crazy turns, and especially in this environment where the um, construction costs, we need to be course correct. And sometimes that takes more effort on our team uh, to, excuse me, to um, you know adjust to these changing schedules and different things. So as a manager, you're in charge of your finances. So you need to understand the metrics that you have and where things are going differently. So reviewing frequently, um, our internal metrics, how we're doing, the hours that are charged to your job, those are all the components of your client facing, your 
inward facing, you're managing your budget. So it's a, it, you're wearing many hats um, as a project manager. So transitioning to, you know, how do we get work? A lot of our work comes in through business development or marketing. We also get <clears throat> uh, RFP, RFQ requests where we have to respond um, to the specific proposal for say someone is interested in building a new uh, warehouse or uh, uh, out in uh, Standish, we may get a proposal and, or an RFP asking us to respond and provide a proposal. But most of our work is really uh, repeat clients. Um, we work in mostly institutions that are 24 seven and there's always work, always projects. So understanding repeat clients. And then also we have our staff that are out everywhere making connections. And there's always an opportunity that happens just from a friend of a friend of a friend sometimes. So doing the work, um, our organization structure, so we're project managed, excuse me, project management falls in our organization chart. It is right in the middle, as you can see, under our um, uh, each individual discipline is there's an architecture, interior, site, electrical, structural, mechanical. Project management is a, a role in the firm that you can be a project manager. You don't need to be an architect to be a project manager, but you do need to have skills in project management. So understanding our structure is an important piece. And some architects in the firm or engineers may be talented architects, but they're great at project management. And that's a career path to either move up to be a project manager or also be a technical leader in architecture or sustainability or design. There's lots of different avenues for how our firm is structured and how we, we um, complete our projects. Um, just speaking to things that we like to align our staff with is, you know, this is sort of where we get the best uh, of everything, where we work with what the client and SMRT needs, we focus on what the employee is really good at, and then also what the employee wants to do, and then that sort of sweet spot of tying all those elements together the engagement and success is, is really key. And we really focus that on aligning those things with a particular client or a type, type of work. The other component that we, we've termed sort of day one thinking. So if you think of any project, you hit a milestone, sometimes you just keep going. And so we'd like to think of day one thinking as when you come to that milestone, that's when you stop and you look back and day one is like restarting the, what did we hear? What did we, what, where do we need to course correct? So in architecture, there's uh, different milestones and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, that are kind of standard terms within our industry. But day one thinking is really um, sort of a mind shift that we've made over the last five to 10 years of, even though you've, you've finished the deadline, the, the, the milestone before you go on to another one you have a day one meeting and that's served us really well um, to kind of restart reboot and and make sure that we're all moving in the right direction the other piece as what's unique for us is we're architects and engineers so all the components of a building um, there's an integrated team and we're really focusing on those these milestones of, of when decisions need to be made and when teams are meeting, when, um, when is there time to think, not just meet. And though we're really finding huge success in, in sort of diagramming and integrating this system of, as you can see on the left, if you started in your visioning state session, previous, Years ago, we would get a program, we'd work with a client. The architect would be the only one early on in a project. 
And what we've been doing is moving all the engineers, all the components, all the folks that have input early into the project, which helps push those decisions early in the project, lets us focus on design and less on rework to fit components into the building. The other piece that I wanted to share is sort of as an industry, forever and ever, architects, engineers, and contractors were always at odds. Um, so the idea on the left here is that the owner is in the middle. The owner um, works, hires an architect, hires a contractor, construction manager, and everything goes through the owner. It's ultimately the owner's project, but there's no contractual relationship between a contractor and an architect other than our drawings, which is a contract in itself. The idea of moving towards where there's a much more team-based system is where our industry is going. And also it's just the right, um, having all the players and the decision makers, I'm kind of hitting this theme of decisions early is a huge component of successful project management in our firm. I mentioned the milestones early on and just to say it for those who are in the middle of projects or sometimes it's confusing on, on the way it works, but early on the idea is that there's a concept phase, there's a, what we call schematic design phase, which is so, and let me just clarify. So concept, schematic design, design development, and construction documents. Those are phases that we make really clear with our client, with our contractors of when things need to be, uh, or items need to be decided on. And I guess the reason I'm sharing this as for you folks is the way a project works is you come up with these, the goals of the project, how big is the project? Schematic, yeah. design, schematic design is the phase where you're, Kind of, you kind of got a picture of what it's going to be, but you haven't sorted everything out. Design development is where you start to finalize how big is the building, where are the walls of the system, what are the systems in the building, and this is where we've been asking for information from the client. And then there's a line in the sand where we're done asking questions, and we're just focused on documenting all the work we've done into the construction documents. Those construction documents are used for permitting and then also for construction. So understanding these milestones and these day one milestone or you know, transitions between phases is super important. So again, being clear on what an owner or if, what the owner is expecting is a clear way of making decisions early and making the project go smoothly. So this is probably way complicated uh, or of a slide than it needs to be, but in our world, so once we finish our drawings, it goes to a contractor. And the contractor, there's different ways that projects are delivered. So there's design bid build, which is say a public uh, school is typically a design bid build project. And that is where, we work with the owner at the programming phase, we design it, we go through all our phases, and then the drawings are complete. The drawings are then issued to five or six contractors to bid on the project. And the construction begins after that bid is in the occupancy. So this is sort of the traditional um, process. There's no input from a co contractor at any phase during design. This is only designers working, um, not understanding supply chain, coordination of constructability, those kind of components that you would think of. So design bid build is one method. The other, the other method is design build. See construction manager, which is called at risk work. And then there's another one called IPD. So really quickly, design build is where the owner hires an architect and a contractor as a team. They work together. They are not separate. And in this world, you're able to overlap design and construction to shorten the duration of the project. 
and the owner has one point of contact, one contract with the design build entity. The construction manager at risk is similar to design build, but it, the, the contracting methods are still separate. So I'm gonna build a building, I'm gonna hire an architect team, I'm gonna hire a contractor, but they're hired at the same time. So some of the elements of the design bid build, the one at the top, still are true contractually, but the idea is that we're, we're, we're brought on board at the same time to offer feedback during the design and construction phase. And so you can see the overlap is, is significant. It may not speed up the project, but there's much more coordination in team building and understanding the project. The last is um, an integrated project delivery, um, which I'll share an example, which is um, where it's a three-party contract between an owner, architect, and contractor. And there's profit put at risk by the architect team and the contractor team. And the goal is if you hit, hit all your project mark, uh, milestones and delivery goals that are established early on, there's actually the profit is, is, is rewarded if you hit your goals. If you go over your goals and you cost more money and you did, you, the team actually loses um, profit. But the, uh, the other component is if the project goes extremely well, there's the idea for incentive. Of, so this is a new, this is a more recent development in our world. It's usually large complex projects, but it really forces sort of the team approach and making this, making all the components tie together uh, contractually. All right. I know I've been flying, my voice is holding up. Um, I'm gonna go through four case studies of sort of similar stories of those projects and, and um, how they're delivered. So LL Bean um, project in Freeport, their headquarters is a construction manager project. So this is the um, uh, sort of contractual um, description. So this is how the contract is, is written. We're tied together. We all started together. In fact, in this project, the construction manager was actually hired first before the architects. Um, so that, that was unique. Um, so the project in Nello Bean, you, you potentially have driven by. The idea was to reimagine their their campus right on, on Main Street um, and, and sort of in, reincorporate some of the warehouses that were, were there to office space and um, a real, real exciting project um, and won one of the AIA awards. Um, and we're really proud of that. But this is, this is sort of the, the idea of the true team project. It was a success for the owner, the architect and the contractor. Everyone was successful in their goals and the team really worked really hard together and it was a great success. Um, University of Southern Maine, um, which is the residence hall and student center, was um, a design build approach with a developer. So the university hired a developer to build the residence hall and then the developer hired a design build team. We were all brought on together <coughs> So it was a unique process and very successful. And so this project should be uh, open this summer, but this is you know reimagining the, the campus in town. Uh, this is a new student center. And then to the right is the, um, well, I have another slide here. Um, the right, on the, up at the upper right, you can see the residence hall and um, the student center and how what used to be a parking lot is now their green um, center of campus. And, and what's really unique about this project, again, the delivery method and how we manage it, we there's a lot of players here, a lot of components. Um, the idea of bringing residence halls to their university campus downtown was to keep the cost affordable for the students. And part of the biggest drive to make it affordable Obviously, we can make construction costs, we can 
lower floor to floor heights, remove finishes. There's things that we can do to reduce the construction cost. But the biggest component that my first slide was on the operation, the long-term cost of a project and how much, how much uh, utilities cost. So the building on the upper right is, a, is designed for passive house standards, which is a, um, a sort of an accreditation program to make sure our buildings are super efficient and tight. And, and the project was is successful because our energy consumption is super low for such a large building, which makes it affordable. And then the university can keep affordable housing for their students to live on campus. So again, this is a win-win where those decisions and the goals are established early and, um, and the team really has to work to those goals because the project wasn't gonna move forward if the, the rental rates weren't um, aligned with uh, the budget. So I mentioned the IPD um, project. Um, so Main General up in Augusta, there was a new replacement hospital. This is where there was an, it was an IPD contract. Um, the owner architect had one contract. They agreed, they, they, there was no um, opportunity. You couldn't sue each other. There was language that they had to, we had to work through problems. We, as I said, we had a risk sharing bubble. We had a common uh, insurance policy, which was unique to the industry. So again, when insurance companies don't like when the contract says that the entities can't sue each other. So understanding how that contract and then insurance would work if there was a catastrophic in incident is unique. So um, this was um, a fantastic project. Uh, the success of it um, was tremendous for a uh, 640,000 square foot facility. Um, it came in uh, under budget uh, by a significant amount and also schedule wise, it was actually eight months earlier than the original uh, schedule. And truly to the point of, because the team was so wetted, and again, we did have profit at risk, so the teams were extra incented to, to uh, meet our goals and exceed them. Uh, let's see. So um, Abbott Labs, um, for those who um, may not know, so the COVID test kits that we have, the Binex now, um, was a, um, a very interesting uh, test kit. We all got used to them. Um, but we were asked in March, April 28th of 2020 to join their team to look at a, an ex a vacant warehouse in Westbrook and to convert it into a, to making uh, the test kits for the COVID. Uh, uh, and one of the pieces with this sort of delivery method, it was, there was no time to assemble the team in the sense of who would be the right players and how we're gonna to work together and contractual language. So we had to assemble the team during uncertainty. We had uh, team members that um, were comfortable traveling to be on a construction site. Um, we had to make these decisions early, but we also had to make any decision. It didn't matter what the decision was because the project had to go fast. Um, we were given, um, uh, there was the first, we had three major deadlines in this project. Um, and actually I'll start the video and let it go through um, while I talk. So the three objectives was, was one was to get the facility up and running within 60 days from the day we started to start training and testing the facility. So 30, 60 days, we had to be up and running. And then 90 days, we had to be actually making test kits. Um, the interesting part is they did not have a successful test kit. They had a platform for the test kits, but they didn't have approval on how the test 
or were they authorized to be used? They didn't even have a successful um, uh, uh, test. The test kit wasn't working when we started the project. They knew they could get there, but, um, and then, so the idea was this was a warehouse in Westbrook. It was vacant. Um, so the project started, we had to remove all the um, racking and systems. And as you can see on the, as it moves around, there's different areas that will highlight, those are the sort of the milestones of when we were up and running. So again, the idea was this facility had to get up and running, operational within 90 days. And then over time, it was gonna ramp up to uh, uh, you know, the number of test kits to increase every month after that initial one was up and running. And then the idea was the facility had to be up and running. And, and it, it, the only way to get uh, equipment to run the facility, we had to install temporary HVAC and generators and power, and then also design the facility to last in the future. So we designed one project to get it up and running, another project to put in final equipment, um, permanent equipment that will actually run the facility. And so this is sort of a diagram a movie that we made to sort of tell the story of how we can get up and running. And um, some of the, the, the components that we bought were elements that we could buy off the shelf. So for example, those white boxes are actually called cooler boxes. So big refrigerated units that are were easy to be uh, installed, put up quickly. Um, the other component with something going this fast is we needed to have the vision for the whole facility to get permitting. And so we we met with the fire marshal, we went with local authorities, um, and it, everything was different about this project. There was an urgency from the client and many of us of, of, of you know, being part of uh, figuring out how to make us living with COVID a little easier and understanding how test kits would fit into it. Um, so we had a real team approach, but we had to be sort of one foot in, get something done quick, and then also figure out, was it um, the cost? Um, I wouldn't say it was um, number one on the idea, it was how quick we could get it. But then uh, as everything, everything switches to cost. And so even at a certain point, we had to figure out how to stay within the budget that was established. Um, so again, it was an exciting project um, for me personally. Our team, we had at one point 25 people, or I'm sorry, 40 people in the firm working on this project. At one point, we had 10 people working on site uh, pretty much full time, uh, seven days a week. Uh, we had representation for, I believe, four months of someone on site every day. Um, and so it's uh, it was a journey and uh, a really, it doesn't fit into any of those delivery methods I, I said before, but what, what was clear was the team approach to our industry is where success happens. When we all go into our traditional silos of doing our work all by ourselves and not showing our work to others, that's where problems happen. So as an industry, we are definitely showing our work earlier than we ever had. You know, nothing's, as I started to say, you know, we can work on a design forever. There's, it's hard to stop. We're always trying to improve it. And in this sort of process, um, we needed to share our work share our thoughts with the team, both the client and the owner or and the contractor, because they had very valid ideas and could be, were very much part of the team and the solution. Um, so uh, anyway, I think I'll skip the rest yeah. of this. Craig, we have a question in the chat, if this is a good, a good spot to ask it. Sure, I'm uh, pretty much done, so. No, no problem. Um, perfect time. Yeah. So Steve Nielsen um, in the chat, he asked, given the expectation of rework that will occur during the process, how much is built into the project, project because of experience versus changes that require a change board approval? Is there a dollar value where a change can be made by SMRT without client approval versus a change that requires a client approval and signature? 
So I think um, the best way for me to answer that question, I think, would be um, so. Change, there's the term change order has many terms in in a contract. So we have the owner has a change order for within the contract of a of a project. We typically think of change orders as only in construction. What we ask for are additional services. And those are when we're in the middle of design, we plan the project and then the scope changes. For, um, you know, it was gonna be a, a three-story building, um, a workplace a office building, it's gonna be three stories. And then the client in the middle of design development decided that it, they wanted to bring another um, department within their organization, and now it's a four-story building. That sort of change is is tough when you're that far into it. Um, so understanding that we need we have tools that we typically use to to um, uh, allow or, or for the client to understand the the scope of what they're asking for and understand how does that change both schedule and our cost. Um, so I don't know if that helps, but rework is a tough one because I guess maybe another way to answer it is as we're integrated, we may come up with things as we develop the drawings, we may discover code related issues that potentially change the scope that is not necessarily something that the owner would be expected to modify but our own internal team needs to do rework because something is discovered either at a review meeting with a, a code official or some other component. So there are things that we do rework that aren't necessarily changes to our contract with the owner, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's really focused more on the scope and uh, you know what our proposal uh, meant. The other, I guess the other component is with our, our world of going faster and interest rates going up, we're constantly being asked to move projects faster. And that is um, tough for lots of folks to, um, I guess it's not tough to deal with, but it, it definitely changes your processes. So a project going quicker, we have to figure out how to break up the project to be able to issue the project in different packages than we normally would. We mm -hmm. like to have the project all in one big package, but a, a lot of times we'll have to split it off in order to meet certain things. And a lot of times that speed to market wasn't what, or speed effort or multiple package wasn't identified early in our proposal. And so understanding their components that we need to um, share with it or certainly share with the client that it's a change and and it'll be a benefit to them in the long run potentially it's 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 less expensive to pay for us than to wait um, pay for us to go faster than to um, as uh, the cost of inflation was going up um, it was a minor cost in the big picture of the project for us to be paid extra to go faster um, right or, Hi, Craig. This is Megan. Thank you for giving us an overview of the SMRT process and, and some insight into some of your successful projects. You you showed a, a slide with a with it looked like probably CGI could have been a virtual drone view, but that technology we're seeing is is the SMRT firm using virtual vision tools to view the completed project on an unfinished product or an empty space or maybe a partial like a a breaking ground type space to, to provide measurements or quality control that reduce those OSHA risks um, or reduce labor overhead. And I asked this because you mentioned being under budget and within schedule and on a project and we do have a tight labor market right now in construction. And, and so just wondering if you're using technology to achieve the, um, the cost controls and the schedule controls there. Yeah, no, that's a great question, um, Megan. I think the, um, I guess the way to think of how we work today, um, maybe maybe I'll tell it more in the transition. So, way 
we used to obviously draw by hand and we had hand drawings and 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 those would be compiled scanned and and actually you know sent on a blueprint machine or a copier machine and gone out today in the last you know we've moved to more of a three-dimensional way that we work we build our models our drawings our models but then there's there's a snapshot in our processes where those models which are three-dimensional need to be um, captured and submitted for permitting so like a local town needs floor plans elevations of the project and the code summary and then those are the way that our traditional way that we share our work and that was always a snapshot in time the same goes for what contractors get is typically they get all the components that that our drawings or we take our model and make drawings from them but the transition now is that our team is sharing the model with the contractor and our platforms of looking at information and understanding the quantities of materials is less um, there's there's a fine line between is our model correct in all its did we build the perfect model and does it have all the information or did we draw the model just to meet our needs for permitting and so for example there's a floor base in our in every room do we actually model the floor base in each room and that someone can then click on that floor base and and prop, um, uh, provide a cost for that but we may just have a note that says in that room there's wall base around everywhere um, so the model isn't perfect it isn't a mini project for most of the components, it is. It's in there. The steel is certainly very accurate. The materials on the outside are very accurate, but there's elements that are missing in the model. Um, but we're we're moving towards the idea of, of 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 the model being a tool that both sides use a little bit better than we have in the past. Um, so how a model is used, you can zoom into any space. You can look at every space. So from a I guess your OSHA risk and, and, and question, I, I don't know how to best answer that because there are components of a project, for example, that a contractor utilizes for safety during construction that we as the architect engineering team don't indicate in our drawings or our model at all. That's something the contractor then adds to whether they put fall protection or other components. Uh, so I, I don't know if that can help, but I, I think the life of the project, the, the life of our model can be used by institutions to use from an operational perspective after the project is built to understand, you know, hey, um, someone reports there's a, a light bulb out. I know we don't have light bulbs anymore, but a light bulb out in X room. Um, the person doesn't necessarily have to go to the room to look at the light and figure out which light bulb. They actually can use the model in a maintenance, a facility maintenance model to go in that room, understand the fixture that was put in there and order a replacement. Um, so the, the, the last part of your question, Megan, was about being under budget and within schedule. Um, some projects today it's almost impossible um and I, I again the best chance you have of meeting schedules and staying under budget is having the contractor who is actually buying the materials and ordering materials and courting they have to be on board day one and so that is almost a prerequisite for projects today the design build uh, traditional design bid build world the there's there's absolutely no way of 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 improving schedules or improving budgets when everything is um, sort of designed or, or procured later in the process. There's a lot of our our work that can be procured. Long lead items can be bought early in the project, even though you haven't figured out everything. 
you can at least get your your spot in line and also lock down the cost of those uh, large equipment. Great. Uh, we do have one more question, Craig. Um, this came, comes from Dana uh, Cochran. She um, asks or says that it seems like SMRT projects follow a more predictive hybrid methodology versus agile. Is this true? I'm not sure if I know the definition of predictive hy hybrid methodology. I would say we're more agile to our own and our, we're always i guess another way to put it is we have the curveballs that happen every day as project managers just like i'm sure all of you and mm -hmm. even though we have systems there are times we have to stray to to be agile um you know there are you know one of the one of the 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 hardest component, hardest decisions that I find as a project manager at times is when we can't meet a deadline. And there's, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, you know, there's, you know, lots of things happening you know, in our COVID world. We would have, you know, um, uh, one of our engineers who was in charge of the project had COVID during the last two weeks of a deadline, and they just are not able to finish the project and as much you know that's just something that you know we all it all pains us when we don't make a deadline or miss or we miss a deadline I should say um but the idea that um there are components where we can identify and change course to still hit a deadline and understand what document what's missing and and potentially follow up after um, and and still keep the project on schedule. So under I guess that sort of agile course correcting or telling the telling the team we need to move this out two weeks because of this. And the benefit will be is that we won't have different pieces issued at different times. And so understanding um, sort of as a as a as a as the project manager, you have to make those kind of decisions a lot. And I find our most successful project managers are, are very um, facile in actually working with their client and or contractor partner, explaining the situation and, and not, you know, the worst thing is to avoid mentioning it and just being late. Um, but the idea of working through the problem as a team whether it's our problem, an owner's problem, or contractor's problem, sharing what you're struggling with has been a huge success for us. And we really ask our project managers and our team members to share what they're struggling with. And that sort of helps our, our sort of um, flexibility and, um, and, and, and allows the team um, to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. Does anyone have any other questions um, they'd like to ask? Oh, Liz just uh, posted another one in the chat. And, and feel free to come off mute, guys, if, if you feel comfortable doing that um, and ask your questions. This is definitely open forum. Um, but I'll go ahead and read Liz's here. Uh, do you have any techniques or suggestions for helping indecisive clients make and commit to decisions early on in the life of a project? Good question. That's a great question, Liz. <laughs> I think part of um, what, and it, maybe this is is basic, but you know, sometimes saying the basics is, you know, our homework as a lot of times, you know, we run from project to project, meeting to meeting, and and sometimes you you show up unprepared, and the that is like such um, a difficult. Um, that that uh, that sort of method. If you continue that sort of, there's no way that you get the client to be uh, pre prepared to make decisions if we're not ready. So the indecisive client, the, I guess the part that I'd like to to sort of reiterate is that our the processes where 
major milestones happen. So for example, I, I think I listed what we call like a floor plan lock. So if you think of, if you're looking at a building, the outside edges of the building, there's a point where we have to say, this is the project, it's 30,000 square feet and it's three floors, and this is the shape. The things in the middle that you're still unsure about, we, we don't need that answer today, but what we need is to lock the, the envelope of the project. And so whatever your issue is with an in, indecisive client is to try to understand what are they indecisive about. And a lot of times what we find is that the client is worried about something we don't need right now. And so they're not willing to approve or that footprint lock because they don't understand how it fits into the sequence. So I would say the key is to understand what we need at what time and then what we need when. And so understanding that schedule and how those milestones align. And, and we um, have found that to be truly these little tools, whether it's a lock or a preference. And sometimes, you know, years ago, we used to have our, our clients sign the floor plans, like they agree, this is it. And um, it's still a very important sign-off phase, but we try to put off that sign-off as late as possible to give the client the ability to, to understand how it affects their operational and their, their, their needs of the program. But I would say that the key is just making those things early on is super important. All right, thank you. Yeah, great question. All right, it looks like Benga has a question. Um, Benga, do you wanna, you, you wanna ask your question to the group? or I can read it here. Many building projects today are integrating new technologies. How does SMRT keep pace with emerging trends? It's a great question, Benga. I think the um, it's hard, hard to stay in front of every new system that is, in, is, is coming out. Um, I think the, you know, for example, the trends in, um, I well, I know a lot of you are IT folks and understanding, you know, those technologies that we plan in the project early in the design. By the time you go and order the system, it's a different system. There's new technologies. And, and so I think integrating these new technologies and understanding when's the right time to make the decision um, is, is super good. I think, you know, how we stay keep pace. So I guess the other sort of side of our industry is that we have, like anything, we are specifying certain parts and pieces of, of a project. And so there's vendors that have these new, new widget, new, new flooring, new X, Y, and Z. And so part of our job is to be meeting with those vendors that have this technology or these changes and bring them to our projects. Sometimes you don't want to be on the bleeding edge and be the first one out, but there are components or elements that staying out front to these vendors and all the components of a project, as long as we have the connections to ask the questions of what's changing, what, the, what are industries moving forward with and, and where we need to, um, you know, things aren't moving, you know, the masonry industry is, is um, the brick industry has not changed much, but how, understanding that the bricks manufacturing process is changing and how it weathers is changing. So it's, it's because of all the components of where materials come from, things change all the time. So even a brick that hasn't changed in forever, the actual brick that we receive on site is changing and how it um, affects the and how it's how it's manufactured and how it affects the environment, we have to be cognizant of. So it's an ongoing battle, Benga, as, as you know, to stay current. Um, you have to rely on your partners. You have to do a lot of your own internal research um, and, and passion for 
looking for what's out there. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions from those um, in either in the chat or? Okay. Well, Danielle, this is Joe. If, if there's no more questions, I'd really, really like to thank Craig for a very yeah. wonderful and engaging presentation. I've learned so much and SMRT um, really is is a critical player in, in the area and is doing some amazing things. So Craig, I mean, it's awesome. The stuff hey, that you yes, definitely. Yeah, we're really excited about sort of where we, where the firm has, has been. I, I celebrated my 25th year at SMRT this year and um, what we, when I first started, we had um, sort of like the scale of a project. We got excited when it was a, a $2 million project and and that was huge. And we were celebrating at champagne. And, and then all of a sudden we were like, there's no way we could ever do a $5 million project. We can, you know, and and the the bar just keeps getting rising and and you know, the the projects are more exciting, they're more complex. And it's all the stuff that our engineers and, and team really enjoy working on because their every project is 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 cutting edge, new in technologies, um, and then also our sustainability side. You know, we've signed on to what's called the AIA 2030 of reducing carbon output in our buildings. Um, both um, AIA, which is the Architect of Architects Association, we also have. Um, mechanical engineers, electrical and structural that all have in their industries ways to reduce carbon. And so a big push on us is educating our clients on the benefits from the operation side. My first slide of that pie of reducing those operations costs is, is good for your, good business, but it's also as we're working towards reducing our impact because our buildings are our biggest impact on the environment. And that is probably one piece I didn't highlight enough in my presentation, but that's the stuff I'm I'm jazzed about, and our our team members are really jazzed about. Um, so it's it's an exciting time, exciting chapter for us. Awesome. Yeah. Well. Th yeah. Again, thank you, Craig, for for the presentation this evening. And um, if there are no additional questions or any additional comments, I think we can conclude. I did post the um, link to our calendar in the chat. So if you're interested in registering for the kickoff of the book club and receiving more information, um, please feel free to register and um, we'll, we'll get you plugged into that new exciting series. Thank you, Danielle. And thank you, Craig. Um, this is an awesome event. And um, Craig, your organization is fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Craig. Thank you.